My name is Ellen Shapiro. I am an iOS developer at Bakken and Beck, but I also uh, have done a lot of Android development over the years. Uh, and so I'm here to talk about Kotlin for Swift developers. Um, so before I get started with this talk, I wanted to ask uh, if you could raise your hand if before tonight you had actually heard of Kotlin. So had you heard of Kotlin? Okay, yes, many of you have heard of Kotlin. So keep your hand up if you work with someone who uses Kotlin. Okay, seems like a lot of people. How many people, and keep your hand up, if you have used Kotlin yourself? A decent number of people. But it seems like there are quite a few of you who have not used Kotlin before. And so to catch you up, if you are not familiar, uh, Kotlin is a relatively new language which primarily runs on the Java Virtual Machine. And it was created by this independent builder of integrated development environments that is called JetBrains. And as Swift developers, you probably know them as the people who build app code. Although you might recognize them a little bit better from the old app code logo, which made it a little bit clearer that app code was for use with Apple technologies uh, than the current logo does. And JetBrains also makes a ton of other IDEs, including ReSharper and RubyMine and PyCharm and PHPStorm. All of these IDEs are descended from a single IDE, and that IDE is IntelliJ IDEA. This is JetBrains' Java IDE. IntelliJ's core is open source, and it has both paid and free editions. And IntelliJ has done a lot to move div uh, Java development forward over the years. Now, JetBrains believes in reusable code, so they've used IntelliJ as the basis for all of these other IDEs over the years. And since IntelliJ was built in Java for Java development, the JetBrains team developed a pretty deep knowledge of the advantages and disadvantages of Java. So when they decided they wanted to try to write their own programming language that could take advantage of a lot of modern language features that Java could be somewhat slow to adopt, they decided they wanted to write a new JVM language. This wasn't a completely insane idea because for years, languages like Clojure and Scala and Groovy had already been built on top of the JVM. Now, none of those languages had the features that JetBrains wanted except for Scala, but at the time that Kotlin was first created in 2010, Scala was known for its really shitty compilation times. So they decided to build a language with all of the features that they wanted, but with really good compilation times, and they named it Kotlin. So what is Kotlin? So first I will give a quick primer on what it is named for. It is an island near St. Petersburg, Russia. And if your geography of this area is a little bit rusty, St. Petersburg is way up in northern Europe, and it is not too far from either Helsinki, Finland, or Tallinn, Estonia. The builders of Kotlin have said that they wanted to name it after an island, since Java itself is named after the, one of the main islands of Indonesia. So as a room full of mostly iOS and Swift developers, most of whom are not from St. Petersburg, uh, you are probably asking yourselves, why on earth should I care about Kotlin? What does this have to do with me? And a big reason if you work with a cross-platform team is that it makes it quite a bit easier to communicate with your Android team about the code that you are sharing. Share some basic thoughts, some architecture, and some logic. Because Kotlin has a lot of features that are really, really similar to Swift. And then it becomes much easier to compare logic with your Android team than, when it, than it was when you were writing in Objective-C and they were writing in Java. Now, how similar are these languages? So let's look at a couple of examples. First, how do you declare a string which is assigned once and never changes? I think you're all familiar with this Swift syntax. The good news is that other than the Kotlin equivalent of let being val, this is identical. Sweet. So how about declaring something that may or may not be there, but if it is, it will be an integer. So again, pretty familiar Swift syntax. And this time, even better, the Kotlin equivalent of this is exactly identical. Like Swift, Kotlin brings native support to, for optionality to a major platform for creating mobile applications. So being able to have optional support was a super big win for Java developers, since it could be used to drastically reduce the number of null pointer exceptions. 
So you know how annoying it is in Objective-C to have something that's nil and then try to put it in an Objective-C array or dictionary, and then it crashes because underlying that is a C array or dictionary. Imagine that happening with literally anything ever that is null. And you can imagine how annoyed Android and Java developers are. So where Objective-C no ops on objects that aren't there, if it's trying to stick something into that underlying C object, Java will throw an objection, on, uh, an exception on any attempt to access a null pointer. And if it is not caught, it crashes your process and on Android, your application. As much help as optionality has been on iOS, in terms of reducing bugs caused by null pointers, it has been a game changer for Android developers who had been writing in Java. So another way, which Kotlin is very, very similar to Swift, is that both have generics and functions as parameters. So Java already had generics, so in this case, Kotlin is just maintaining an existing piece of function functionality. But being able to pass functions as parameters to another function is new, unless you do some really, really interesting stuff. So in Swift, you can use generics to say you want to apply a function to anything. And it can be used pretty easily by passing in both the thing you want to apply the function to and the function itself in the same method. In Kotlin, generics are even more powerful because you're able to actually create an extension function, which is similar to a Swift extension, on a generic type. So now you can call this on any type and apply any function designed to return any other type. And this language feature allows the use of some of the same major collection methods, like map, filter, and reduce. Now, the map and filter operators in Kotlin are exactly the same as they are in Swift. The map operator takes a collection of things, applies the same passed-in transformational function to each thing, and then returns a, a collection of the results of each of those individual operations. The filter operator checks each thing in the collection against the same passed-in Boolean function, and then returns a collection of anything for which that Boolean returned true. Reduce is somewhat similar, but there is a small, annoying distinction where to get the exact beha same behavior as you get in Swift, you actually have to use a different function. So in Swift, when you reduce the contents of a collection, it applies whatever function is passed in by taking the accumulator, the start value of which is passed in as the first parameter of the reduce operator. Although I have to admit, I really hate this syntax for, for this kind of function. That's also not really something that's available in Kotlin, so I'm going to make it ever so slightly clearer that the things being added here are the first and second parameter being passed into the closure. And in this case, when you have an initial value of zero, zero, adding each of the other numbers to that accumulated value of the other numbers winds up being six. But if you want to start somewhere other than zero or a similarly empty value for whatever you're reducing, you can do that really, really easily by changing the initial value here. I change it to 20, so the result is 26. So you're probably familiar with that part, but when you go to use reduce in Kotlin, it turns out that the reduce function has no initial value. It just always starts with an empty of whatever is expected to be returned, so of zero value for integers in this case. So what do you do if you actually want to use the initial value parameter when you're working in Kotlin? Well, you have to actually use a different method, and that method is called fold. And you can see that in the end, this does exactly the same thing that reduce does in Swift. Now, as I was going through this example, you might have noticed that there are a couple of things that Kotlin does slightly differently when it comes to parameter placeholders for functions. So in Swift, we use the dollar sign and the parameter index to indicate which parameter we're attempting to access. In Kotlin, if you have a single parameter, you use the it keyword. And this always makes me think of the Stephen King movie, It, but with the clown trying to get me to use Kotlin. And just as there is one insanely creepy clown in It, you can only use It to represent either a single parameter or a tuple of all of the parameters being passed into your function. Anything beyond that, and as you saw before, while you can use multiple dollar sign parameters, just building up as many dollars as you want in Swift. In Kotlin, you might have noticed earlier that if you want to access 
more than a single or the entire set of parameters as a single blob, you actually have to break it into multiple variables. So there are more than a few of these little annoyances, but for the most part, Kotlin and Swift code can look extremely similar. All of these similarities can lead to better communication between you and the folks working on your Android application. You will be able to look at their code, and despite some of the differences in view lifecycle and architecture, you'll be able to have an idea of what is happening way more quickly. And the same thing goes for Kotlin developers looking at your code. A fun side effect of this is that you become much more able to talk about common tooling and architecture ideas. And in addition, no platform or language does everything entirely right. But the more you learn about how other people tackle the same problem, the easier it is to steal some of the same techniques and tools for your language. And there's two things I want to point out, one for each language that I think the other language could benefit from stealing. The first is that Kotlin should really steal Swift's guard syntax. There's currently a syntax for dealing with optionals that does only do this if uh, this actually exists, and it's this. Optional thing dot let, and then start a thing. Instead, it's a let instead of val to unwrap, unwrap, because I guess the Kotlin designers wanted to make a distinction with the operator and the keyword, or making it dot val would be far too simple. Um, personally, I find this to be way too similar to checking nullability and then force unwrapping. And in Kotlin, you have to do that with two explanation points instead of one. Uh, if you find the object to be non-null. I really do agree that if it fails, bail out model of Swift is easier to read in the long run. So I'd be really, really happy to see something like that in Kotlin. Um, now there's a nice thing that Kotlin does as well that I think Swift should steal, which is the apply function. Now right now in Swift, if you have a single instance of something, especially if it's a singleton, which you want to apply multiple things to, you either have to access that singleton in full for every single one of those actions, or pull it into a single variable and then repeatedly access that single variable. What the apply function in Kotlin, as I propose it be stolen by Swift, would allow you to do is set values in a single closure on the given type. It's a little bit of an adjustment reading things this way, but once you make the adjustment, it can actually be really, really, really helpful. So what if all of this sounds really good, but you do not want to deal with Java? So good news, you have a few options. Kotlin already has functionality that allows it to be cross-compiled into JavaScript. The idea is somewhat similar to TypeScript. Shout out to the, to, to the framework folks. Uh, in that you want type safety without necessarily having to give up the wide array of libraries that you can take advantage of in JavaScript. But the thing that may be more interest to all of you as Swift and iOS developers is something called Kotlin Native. Kotlin Native is, a is an experimental pro program that is currently in early access preview. So this is the functional equivalent of an alpha release, but it sounds way cooler. Um, the Kotlin Native program allows Kotlin code to be compiled using LLVM into machine code. And if that sounds familiar, that is because LLVM is the same compiler that is used by Swift. And it was built as the graduate thesis of some dude named Chris Latner, who you may better know as the inventor of Swift. Fun fact, Latner's, Latner's doctoral thesis was an LLVM. It was his master's thesis. Every time I am reminded of this fact, I feel about five years older. Um, anyway, what it means is that LLVM is being used to compile Kotlin. And the compiled code can run directly on various processor arch architectures without the need for a virtual machine. And what that means is theoretically, code compiled from Kotlin could be optimized for particular architectures in ways that are just not possible for the JVM. And because a ton of architectures are actually supported out of the box by LLVM, that means that Kotlin Native can also support a lot out of the box. While they don't support everything that LLVM supports, the list of supported programs for what is essentially an experimental alpha release is pretty impressive and points to the long-term ambition of Kotlin Native. Clearly, JetBrains wants to turn Kotlin into a language which allows for shared modules across many different kinds of architecture. So to help facilitate doing this, JetBrains built a plugin and a build system 
for IntelliJ and Android Studio, which helps abstract away a lot of the inconveniences of making all of this work. They named it Conan with a K, just like Kotlin, because they really like consistent branding. And when you go through some of the setup process for building the binaries you need to run, you'll get a pretty good idea that this is still something that is still in an experimental phase. And warning, important, the library format is unstable. Now it can change with any new git commit come out without warning. <laughs> when you are working with any fairly new tool, you usually want to look at the documentation for how to use it. Unfortunately, Kotlin Native's documentation <laughs> is sometimes non-existent, sometimes well updated, and sometimes super outdated. It is often really, really hard to tell without a lot of trial and error, which is the case for any given subset of the code. I can tell you that the setting up from scratch portion of this is very poorly documented at the moment, since there are a large number of pieces of the puzzle that are you basically have to find through trial and error. Personally, I'm still in the error portion of this process. <laughs> so bear in mind that while this is a technology with a ton of potential, it's really not ready to use in production unless you're willing to take a huge, huge risk. But one thing that in the long term Kotlin native means is that despite everything I said earlier about Kotlin being born on the Java virtual machine, now you can choose whether or not you want to use Kotlin with or without Java. I suspect that most of you, given the opportunity, would choose without. So if all of this has gotten you interested in working with Kotlin, there are a few places that you can get started. The first is an online sandbox called trykotlinlang.org. And what it allows you to do is create some super, super simple Kotlin code in a website. And then it lets you mess around with it and see a little bit about how your changes will change the output. And this is completely in a website. You don't have to download a single thing in order to get this to work. If you've managed enough to commit to downloading either IntelliJ or Android Studio, both of which at least have a free version, you can try the EDU Tools pr plugin. You install it through your IDE, and it gets special treatment since it's a plugin created and maintained by JetBrains. Once it's installed, you can download a course called Kotlin Coens, which gives you some challenges you can use to teach yourself Kotlin. And it's really, really great because it's baked into your IDE. You don't have to worry about the internet being flaky to see if, it, see if something actually works. And having the ability to just randomly mess around with this stuff is super, super fun, and it encourages you to explore. And for now, we've come to the obligatory summary slide. Uh, previously, I had less space than usual because most of this had to be translated into Japanese because I originally gave this talk uh, in Tokyo. But now, hey, we don't have to translate it into Japanese. We'll still keep it simple. Kotlin allows you to be friendlier with your Android team, sharing your joys and your triumphs along with your frustration and your tribulations. And while Kotlin native is super cool, it's not quite ready to be used in the real world. I am really, really, really excited to see what it says about the future of Kotlin as a language which could potentially be independent of the JVM. In the end, my advice boils down to one thing. Give Kotlin a try. Since you know this is a, a, a Swift and iOS meetup, I must pay homage to Steve Jobs and announce there's one more thing, which naturally is a shameless plug. Um, I have done a ton of writing for raywenderlich.com in the past uh, for iOS stuff. But if you are interested in learning more about Kotlin, you'll be happy to hear that the tutor tutorial team is branching out. And we have two new books out with tons and tons and tons of Kotlin. One is finished, it is officially released. It is called Android Apprentice. I was one of the tech editors on that. You can learn how to build a number of increasingly complex Android applications. It's pretty fun. Uh, the other Kotlin Apprentice uh, is in early access preview, and I am one of the authors on it, uh, which means I am probably going to be working on one of my chapters on the way back to Nijmegen. Um, but <laughs> If you're interested in learning more about Kotlin, please check out these books and some other. We, we've got lots of other cool Android and Kotlin content at raywonderlich.com. Uh, have have a look when you have a chance. The, uh, the platform versus language, uh, what I could expect from the title? Or? 
Good, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, is the platform versus language what you could expect from the title? I think in general, yes, but Android Apprentice is entirely in Kotlin. So uh, there, is, there is not a point at which you learn how to build an Android application in Java and then translate it to Kotlin. No, you just start in Kotlin and then start running from there. Um, and you know, if, you've, if you're someone who has worked with Swift before, I think you should have a relatively easy time working with the Android Apprentice stuff because there's, there's stuff that you can learn how to translate relatively easily. If you're familiar with the Ray Wenderlich series of books, Kotlin Apprentice is more similar to Swift Apprentice where it's like, hey, I have never programmed before. How do computers? Um, and um, you know, going from that phase to, hey, I actually have a reasonably good idea of how all of this shit works. And um, if, you're, if you're sort of beyond that point, like you can sort of start from the how do computers point and then go into, whoa, this is way harder than I thought it would be. Um, or you can sort of start halfway through the book and go, go from like, OK, I have a general idea of what generics and optionals are. Whoa, this is way harder than I thought it would be. Um, and go from there. But Android Apprentice is, is more tied to specifically Android APIs and how to actually make an Android application. So like I said, I helped tech edit this one. And then tiny, tiny name here. I am one of the, <laughs> the authors on this one. Um, so if anyone has any questions afterwards, please let me know. But I'm happy to answer whatever I possibly can. Uh, and uh, with that, good night. Until then. Um, and I'll, I'll, put, I'll put my slides up. I've got some links uh, to, to assorted um, documentation about what's going on with, with Kotlin. I see a question from Danielle. Yeah, I wonder, is Bakken and Beck hiring iOS and Android developers? The question is, is Bakken and Beck hiring iOS and, and Android developers? Gee, Daniel, I wonder why you ask that question. Um, <laughs> yes, we are hiring iOS and or Android developers. So if you are looking for an iOS and or Android job, uh, please come talk to uh, myself or Robert Hine or Daniel. Start waving at people. Can you? Yeah, that guy. Uh, or Marine. Uh, Marine, can you can you wave at people again? Yay! Uh, we are more than happy to talk to you about working here and uh, uh, the, the the wonderful things that we do. Um, so yeah, if you uh, and our Android team is almost entirely working in Kotlin. Um, there's occasionally things we still have to do in Java, but Similar, similarly on iOS, there's occasionally things we still have to do in Objective-C. Uh, I think most of you are sort of familiar with that paradigm. Um, does anyone have any other non-preset uh, uh, questions? Yes? So for cross-platform development, what would you advise if not Kotlin? So for the question is, for cross-platform development, yeah. what would I advise if not Kotlin? That's an excellent question. Uh, in production, I, I, I personally actually advise just writing it in native code um, because I have personally found in my experience that um, having someone who is familiar with the sort of ins and out of each platform is much, much, much more helpful than having someone who is familiar with the, with the particular ins and outs of languages. I do know that a lot of people have had significant success with React Native, but you can't necessarily write one thing in React Native and have it run on both platforms. You often can write your model layer in, in one language, so in either React Native or Xamarin or something like that, but you still have to do a ton of stuff for UI in uh, the sort of, even if you're writing in the same language, you're still having to take, in, take, take into account all of the APIs in different languages or in, in different um, platforms because particularly when it comes to the way that iOS and Android deal with view lifecycle, um, they're really, really, really different. Um, the most obvious example I like to tell to uh, iOS developers to completely horrify them is that if you rotate an Android device, it kills the current activity, which is basically similar to a view controller, and it rebuilds all of it from scratch. So imagine having a view controller that goes all the way to <laughs> that goes all the way to Dialic when you rotate the phone, and this is what Android developers are dealing with. Um, so this is why they're all so grumpy. Um, <laughs> And so there are some ways around this. There are some new um, APIs that make this 
basically less horrifying. Um, but it is something where um, you can't really write once and run everywhere. And I think any platform that purports to say you can write once and run everywhere is, is ignoring what happens on each individual platform. You may be able to write everything in one language, but you will probably not be able to write once. And, and that's something that you need to take into account. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, compared to, like, th there are some efforts to take Swift across platforms. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, they are not finished yet. Ever. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, like, copy native being not finished yet. Ever. How, how would you compare them? Because I have more. Yeah. Idea about it. So comparing, comparing the efforts to take Swift cross platform versus um, Kotlin native. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest difference that I see is that Kotlin Native is actually being driven by JetBrains, who are the people who created the Kotlin language. Um, Kotlin, this is basically sort of a strategic move on their part to be able to use Kotlin in multiple places and be able to sort of be like, Kotlin's taken over the world. Um, the, the movement, like everything that I've seen in terms of PRs and, and efforts to actually get Swift to run on Android has all come from the community. This has all come, a, a lot of it has come from um, Brian, I can't remember what the hell his last name is at Facebook, um, Moto, Moto Cash on Twitter. Um, and a lot of that stuff is, is something where Apple has been happy to merge all of it, but it doesn't really seem like they're going to be doing a lot on their end to support it actively. Whereas React Native, or sorry, where Kotlin Native, not React Native, um, it is coming from a place where the people who are designing the language are purposefully making this choice to say this is a thing that we want to do. Yeah. So that's 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 the difference that I see. What about big bunch of keywords like IBM and Apache Brown? So, so the question is, what about Vapor versus Kitura? Is it IBM versus sort of a, a a more independent group of developers? I actually see that as a little bit of a different thing, just because um, they're not working at a language level, they're working at a, a server level. Um, and this is something where you can set up a server in any language that you want. You can you can write it in Node or you can, like, I don't know, you could probably write it in Basic if you really felt like it. But, um, you know, it, it's something where, this is something where the question is not what platform am I using to create my, my server, it's what language am I using to write everything. And that's where I see the difference. You've, yeah. you've had a question. I have two small related questions. Uh, one, the first one is, uh, which one is older? Which of the two languages? And the second is, uh, is it a coincidence that they are just similar? Yeah, so, so the first question is, which one is older? And I actually don't know the answer to that. They, they sort of came together around the same time. So, so I believe, uh, I saw a hand go up and say Swift. Um, yeah, so, so um, I, I know that um, Swift, when they open sourced it, they showed every single commit that had ever happened to Swift, which was not something I was expecting Apple to do. Um, but it started in late 2010, if I recall correctly. And then uh, 2011 is around when uh, Kotlin started as, a, as sort of an internal project at Jet, JetBrains. Um, Run the second question by me one more time because I have a coincidence that they're that similar. Is it a coincidence that they are that similar? I would say no. Um, I, I think they're both heavily influenced by a couple of different languages. The first is Haskell, um, which is not necessarily something that a lot of uh, people who are outside of either uh, Mozilla or um, academic development wind up using. But it's a, it's a highly influential pr um, functional language. And the ability to pass a function as a parameter allows some, some ways of sort of composing code that are not really possible in languages that don't really allow that. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's something that I think highly influenced both of them. I think Go also influenced uh, both of them a bit. I think the fact that you know as you were getting to 2010 and 2011, especially when you're working on mobile operating systems, people are realizing like, oh, if something isn't there that I think is going to be there, it fucks everything up. Um, why, why shouldn't I know when I'm writing something 
whether or not I think it's going to be there. And that's, that's something that I think has influenced both languages um, pretty heavily. And, and that's something that, you know, obviously there's been tons and tons and tons of research around this in, in computer science. But I think it's, it's something where one of the things that, that I've seen actually pushes research into the realm of sort of everyday use is when people identify, oh, this thing that all these researchers have been talking about, this actually has day-to-day -day application for what I'm working on. So that, that's my personal opinion. I, I, I can't say I've done a million hours of research on it, but that's, that's what I've seen from the research that I've done. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, if I know it correct, you can use Kotlin Native in iOS projects, right? Yes. In theory, you should be able to use Kotlin Native in iOS projects. Actually, the Kotlin Conf app for, uh, for last year that was written for iOS was written with Kotlin Native. I tried to compile it. It did not work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something where... The, this is where the lack of documentation on Kotlin Native is kind of a pain in the ass because you're like, okay, I know you made this work somehow. Da, why can't I make this work? Um, and it is something where I think as they get it beyond an alpha program into beta and into a final release, you'll get a more repeatable build process that allows you to actually say, hey, I can take this language and I can have it talk to all of these iOS APIs without this sort of insanity that you have to do right now. And you know, in theory, if uh, it works, uh, which runtime Kotlin is using in this case? Because it doesn't use its own runtime. It should use Objective-C runtime or C? I believe it uses the Objective-C runtime. Um, so the question is, does it use the Objective-C or Swift runtime? My understanding is that it, it uses the Objective-C runtime um, just because of basically Swift not necessarily being ABI stable. So you're, you're able to make something that, as long as it's compiled so that it eventually sort of looks like the same thing that was compiled from Objective-C via LLVM, then it can go out and do whatever the hell you want. Versus uh, if you were working on something that was compiled by Swift into LLVM, in theory that's still supposed to work the same way, but in practice this is why you have to include the Swift binary in every application that you have until we actually get ABI stability like knock wood in eight, uh, Swift 5, but we'll see. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's my understanding of it. Does that answer your question? Yay. Does anyone else have any more questions? Yay. Yeah. Thank, thank you all very much for coming.